Hey guys, welcome to BMW Blog and welcome once again to Arizona. Today is the day when I have a chance to drive the brand new BMW M2. It's actually my second take with the car because last year I went to Austria to sample these two cars on the track. And what I mean by these two cars, well, right here we have the BMW M2 in Zenvor Blue six-speed manual. And right next to me, I also have a Brooklyn Gray eight-speed automatic. So the plan goes something like this today. I'm gonna to be driving this car first, six-speed manual, and then I'm gonna hop into the eight-speed automatic and see how they compare. At the end of this video, I'm gonna tell you which one would be my choice if it was my personal car. So before we go behind the wheel and sample the car, let's talk a little bit about the project, the G87, and maybe compare to the previous one, F87. I'm not going to focus on the design details because we've talked about quite a bit, but I'm only going to nitpick a few things that I've learned over the last few days, which are quite unique to the M2. And that starts with the design. This is a functional design. It's the philosophy of BMW that function before form, basically. And that's exactly what they wanted to implement with the new M2. And I'm going to give you some specific details air breathers you can see this squared up shape right here and that's actually a functional form because right behind this air breathers there is a cooling placement and it's exactly the same square shape and of course because of that the airflow goes a lot better through that and that was the idea of those air breathers and that particular shape of course, the same philosophy applies to the central air intake. And if you look behind the shape right there, you will see a similar shape of the cooling. So once again, a functional piece, not necessarily a styling piece. And I guess that's the overall idea of the car. Another interesting thing that I just found out is that the glass of the headlight, it's actually different than what you see on the two series. I don't know exactly all the specifics, but I was told that by using this one, it kind of emphasizes even more the new headlights. So those are some of the quick details that are kind of unique to the BMW M2 at the front. But let's talk about the side view. And I'm going to point out something right here. Of course, you've seen that there is no side gear like on other BMW cars. And that was a decision made based purely on functionality because I learned that the car has a really good aerodynamic coefficient on the side, so there was no need to add any piece out there that might not be functional. So that's why you're not getting the side gill on the BMW M2. Overall, you can see the clean shapes out here, and I was told that they were inspired by motorsport, by racing. So that's kind of the idea behind the design on the side of the BMW M2. Now, if you go to the back, one piece that's quite controversial is probably the vertical reflector right here you can see it kind of sticks out a little bit and it's integrated into the bumper and once again that was a decision made based on function because i was told that this particular piece actually helps quite a bit with aero drag i don't have the exact specifics the exact numbers but that was the reason why they decided to go with that vertical approach same goes for the taillights. As you can see, they stick out a little bit more. And this piece right here apparently also has a really nice airflow, and that also helps with the overall aero coefficient. So once again, that's kind of the idea of the new BMW M2 to make this car ready for the racetrack. And this is why it's quite different from the F87. Now, when it comes to some engineering tricks, I've actually learned quite a few last night. If you open the hood, you're gonna see out there a triangle brace strut, which basically helps to keep things very, very tight. But there is an additional actual plate in there, which helps even more with the rigidity of the front end. Additionally, I learned last night that right here, on the C pillar, there is an additional plate that's kind of shaped around the chassis, which helps to keep that rear end in check. So instead of getting the playful rear end of the F87, you're getting a lot stiffer BMW M2 this time around. And I'm hoping that I'm going to be able to experience that on the road. And because a lot of the pieces are coming from the M3 and M4, of course, underbody, if you lift up the car, you're going to see another plate, which also helps with the stability, rigidity, and the stiffness of the entire car and of the chassis as well. So I'm not going to bore you too much with the details. I'm going to sample the cars because it's all about driving these cars in a 
daily driving situation also because I want to see how they behave in maybe in stop and go traffic but also we're gonna go on some of those mountain roads out here and apparently they're super fun so I can't wait to try this car on. I'm gonna tell you in the video more about the specs there are also some new things that I've learned about the car and about future products as well so make sure you don't go anywhere it might be a very very long video but I promise you it will be worth it so let's hop behind the wheel and take a look at the new BMW M2 and how it drives. All right, so we're about to go for a drive with the BMW M2. And let me tell you how the day it's going to go. So that way you kind of have an idea what to expect in this video. There, First of all, there are a lot of people driving this car. And there was a huge group of journalists that came out here to Phoenix, Arizona, Scottsdale to drive the car. In this particular wave, there are a lot of YouTubers. You, you will see a lot of videos. So, of course, I have to do things a little bit different. Speaking of that, so... I'm gonna focus quite a bit on the dynamics of the car, the driving experience, and I'm gonna to get to a road where there are a lot of curves and I can really push the car. I'm gonna be driving first a manual, six-speed manual, and then later today, I'll be switching into an eight-speed automatic. So right now, I'm in a Zenver Blue six-speed manual. Later, I will have the Brooklyn Gray BMW M2s. So right now, I'm actually driving pretty flat. I'm on a highway, I'm gonna head to the scenic road as they call it apparently it's really nice i'm going to be able to really push the car and try the different driving modes mdm and all of that i'm going to have some performance numbers also i had a chance to film the zero to 60 with this car there are going to be some drive-bys so a lot of exciting content but at the same time i don't want to just focus with the bmw m2 on the driving dynamics if you hit any uh, scenic roads or the track and all of that. I drove the car on the track last year. I shared my thoughts on that and we'll have another track component in the future. Today, I also wanna focus on the car's drivability as a daily driver, right? Because not all of us, actually, I would say majority of us will never take the M2 to the track. It's ideal that we do so and I highly encourage you to do that if you can afford it. You'll have a lot of fun with the car, no doubts about it. Let's start with the BMW M2. Let me tell you a few things that I've learned because I spent a lot of time last night talking to the engineers. I wanted to kind of go really deep into the details of the car and be able to tell you something different than everybody else will tell you. But I want to focus a little bit on the technical details of the car a lot more than maybe others will. So essentially, the BMW M2 might look like a mini M4 from a technology perspective because a lot of the bits were inherited from the BMW M4. Yet, when I talked to the project manager last night, he told me that their goal was really not to make a mini M4. They wanted the M2 to have its own identity, right? They don't want people to say, well, I cannot afford an M4, and I'm gonna buy the M2. No, they wanted the M2 to be something special, something very unique, and something that you don't usually see in the segment today because this segment is quite interesting, right? There are not a lot of players in this segment, and certainly the BMW M2 is probably one of the best cars in this segment. So clearly they wanted to maintain that advantage by building a pure driver's car. So of course I had to ask the question, what was the benchmark for the new G87 M2? Was it the M4, the G82? Was it the previous F87 M2 competition or the M2 CS? Not surprisingly, they actually said that the M2 competition from the F87 family was the reference point, the benchmark for this car. And I had to ask why, why not the M2 CS? Because that would be the logical thing to do probably. You wanna beat the best car that you had before. And especially since they kinda of have the same power output, um, they also ride on standard adaptive M suspension and more on that later. But the project manager told me once again, the M2 Comp is the more mainstream car. It is not a special edition like the CS and they didn't want people to think that, you know, we're gonna build a new M2 CS based on this one. And then essentially, uh, you know, maybe disappoint some other people that were expecting more of an M2 competition type of car. The previous M2 competition was the benchmark for this car and they wanted to improve not only the drivability of that car but also the daily comfort and i'm going to talk about that next because just like with most new bmws they wanted to extend that gap in between the driving modes clearly it comes with the comfort and sport and sport plus and you can customize that quite a bit and once again i'm going to show you that as well and we're going to talk about the different modes too so they wanted to have a very comfortable mode 
So people, they want to daily drive this one. They don't want to feel like when they get out of the car, they're exhausted or tired, which would make sense if you're constantly in a car like an M2CS where it's always on and very twitchy, very, very sporty and, and very rigid. But at the same time, they don't want it to compromise on the sportiness of the car. So they said, well, now because we have a very comfortable car, we also want to make sure that once you switch <laughs> the button right there into Sport or Sport Plus, you are getting a pure M car. So now the Sport mode, it's a lot sportier, if you will, than the M2 competitions mode. And that's something that I really want to test today. So let's talk about some of the specs. So let's start with the engine, maybe. BMW's S68 3.0 liter six cylinder inherited from the M3 and M4. And in this particular application, it makes 453 horsepower and 406 pounds feet of torque. If you're in Europe, that's about 550 Newton meters of torque. Performance wise, there is a difference in between the six speed manual and the eight speed automatic, as you would expect. The manual car gets from zero to 62 miles per hour, so zero to 100 kph in 4.3 seconds. If you want to go for the more standard 0 to 60, I would guess that would be about 4.1 seconds with a manual transmission. When it comes to the automatic, the 8-speed auto, it runs the same sprint in about 4.1 seconds from 0 to 62. And if you want to go for the 0 to 60 time, it does it in about 3.9 seconds. The official times from 0 to 124 miles per hour sprint comes in in 14.3 seconds with the manual and 13.5 seconds with automatic. The standard top speed is 155 miles per hour, no surprise there, but of course you can raise that up with the optional M driver's package and you can go up to 177 miles per hour. The engineer also emphasized the fact that they're using the very same engine in the BMW M GT4. And once again, you have this correlation in between the BMW M brand and the motorsport division. So in a way, it's interesting to see that they still have the same philosophy and the same ties between the M division and motorsport. And in a way, it's very reassuring that they're also testing the same engine in a very uh, you know, racing environment, endurance uh, racing and all of that. And that gives me the assurance that this might be actually a reliable engine for the future. Nonetheless, it's also cool to tell people, hey, by the way, that M4 GT4 that you see on the track, it actually has the same engine as my BMW M2. So that's another fun fact that you can use to brag to your friends, for example. Let's talk more about the specs. So let's start maybe with the wheelbase compared to the M4. It has a shorter wheelbase, 4.3 inches shorter. That's about 110 millimeters shorter but it has the same track width at the rear and the front. So as you can assume, that's gonna make a difference when you track the car or when you drive it very, very dynamic and we'll have a chance to test that. Now, if you're comparing this one with the M240i, a lot of you might know the specs by now, but let's just recap them quickly. It is bigger than a normal 2 Series, and it's also about 2.2 inches wider, which is about 54 millimeters, and you can actually see that from the rear. I mean, honestly, this car stands out on the road. If you're driving behind one of them, you'll see how wide those hips really are, and it absolutely truly reminds me of my personal 1M, which is one of my favorite M cars of all time. Speaking of the synergy between the M2 and M4, of course, we have to mention the tires. Same tires and wheels from the M4, 19 inches at the front and 20 inches in the back. I believe they're 275, 35 front, and then you're getting 285, 30 in the back when it comes to tires. You have an option of Michelin PS4S and some other high performance tires. The braking system is also inherited from the M3 and M4, the brake by wire system. And we're gonna talk about that a little bit later because we're gonna have a chance to actually change some of the settings and see how they behave. So once again, another component that came from the BMW M4. 
I briefly mentioned the M adaptive suspension. So for the first time, it is standard in the BMW M2. It was standard only in the BMW M2 CS, the previous one. So it's nice to see the BMW is thinking about the new M2 as being more of a 360 type of product that can cover a wide range of customers. Moving on, the cooling also comes from the BMW M4 and I talked about that in the intro video and you saw some of the functional pieces and then of course you're also getting the same steering rack from the M4. I had to ask the engineer once again, is there a difference in between the steering rack uh, on the M4 versus the new M2? Any hardware changes, any mechanical changes? And the answer was short, no. Basically, it's the same steering rack, only the application is different. So what do you mean by application? Well, the softer tuning on the car, it is adapted for the M2, mostly because of the car size, because of its proportions, and of course the weight, so on and so forth. So essentially, you will get a little bit of a different steering feedback in the M2. It might seem like it's a little bit more engaging, and it actually is, even driving straight, you can get a lot of feedback from the road, and that has to do mostly with the car size, the car's rigidity, the chassis, and so on and so forth. Now, before we go further and talk about the driving experience, hopefully we get to my destination very soon, we also need to talk about the M240i and the BMW M2. In my opinion, they are not comparable. Even just by driving the car just a little bit, I can tell you that there is clearly a gap in between the two products as intended. But then once again, not everybody wants an M2 and a lot of people are extremely happy with the M240i because that's a very, very good car as well. Of course, I would say the M240i has the advantage currently of the X-Drive system because that allows it to be more of a year-round type of car. And of course, it probably has a lot more grip on straight lines and so on and so forth. Anybody cares about the performance on the straight line when it comes to these two cars. The BMW M240i also comes with an M Sport differential. It is tuned a little bit different than in the M2, clearly. And also it has the adaptive M suspension. So the idea of an M light car is quite valid. Honestly, I hear that term quite a bit. It might not be flattery to the entire BMW M brand, but I can tell you for sure that the M240i could be called an M light and probably the other M performance uh, BMW cars as well. Naturally, a lot of people say, well, I have an M240i, now I can go up to an M2, I can add a tune, and I can tune the suspension a little bit more, and I'm gonna get the M2. I can tell you right now, that's probably incorrect. You might think you're getting the same car, but there are a lot of differences when it comes to the M2, and especially to its chassis. Now, one thing that maybe not a lot of people knew, and this is where I said, I'm gonna focus on some of these tiny details because they're quite interesting. The C-pillar, has an additional plate there. So they shaped the plate based on the form of the C-pillar. You can see it clearly, it's part of the chassis, but that idea there was really to bring the rear in even more, kind of keeping it tight. So if you thought that the M3 and M4 were tight, this one is really tight as well in the back. So of course there are plenty of benefits, but I guess the one of them that I can mention you know, immediately and once I'm gonna quarter the car up, I'm gonna feel that because I felt it on the track as well. It's really how little to no body roll there is in the new M2. And I think you'll have to push the car to its absolute limits to get any body roll out of this car. Not only in the Sport Plus mode or Sport mode, I was told that even in Comfort, it helps quite a bit to actually keep that rear in check. And I asked why, because everybody wants a BMW M car to be playful in the back, you know, to allow you to kind of slide out a little bit. And the answer was simply because we thought about this car as a racetrack car. They said we wanted to start with the idea that the M2 is a, it's a racetrack car. A lot of people might want to race this and want to build a pure racing machine out of the M2. So instead of having that very playful rear, they said we wanted to make sure that while you're on the track, you're able to actually go fast into corners, exit fast, without having to fight the rear end, which makes a lot of sense, right? Many times we think that if you go on the track and drift and slide, we're gonna be the cool guys and fast, but no, the idea on the track, as many of you probably know, it's all about the racing line, keeping that composed racing line and making sure that you enter and exit properly, very smooth and very, very fast. So once again, that's one big difference compared also to the previous generation, which was 
maybe not as controllable as this one. It was definitely playful in the rear, which is never a bad thing, honestly, because you could have a lot of fun with that. You're not gonna get in trouble as long as you keep all the dandy controls on, even the MDM mode and so on and so forth. So not a bad thing, just different, different characters. So that's one cool tech bit that they were able to share with me. That brings me back to the M240i because I went off tangent a little bit. So let's finish that chapter quickly. Of course, the cooling components are very different in the M240i versus the M2. This one is getting the ones from the M3 and M4. So clearly on a totally different level, so you're not gonna get the same cooling. Of course, you can always upgrade and go aftermarket. Not a problem, but it's not an OEM car then. The chassis and handling, it is absolutely different. I experienced that on the track, so they're not comparable when it comes to uh, track component and how they feel. Very, very different. Of course, you can still be fast with the M240i. It's a very, very competent car on the track as well. I would say the steering, also at a first glance, it is different. It is a lot more direct and heavy in the M2, even going on a straight line, as you can see right here. I'm getting plenty, plenty of feedback, and it just feels connected to the road quite a bit. And honestly, I'm actually riding in comfort right now. I'm not even in the highest setting. The brakes and tires, of course, are also superior in the BMW M2 versus the M240i. And um, naturally, once again, you can also go to the M performance parts and maybe get some aftermarket brakes for the M240i. I might bring it closer, but from a stock position, they are different. And then, of course, the size, it is also different. You're getting bucket seats, carbon bucket seats in the M2. You're not getting those in the M240i. So another big difference in between the two cars. So in a nutshell, if you were to compare the M240i with the M2, of course you can. In some cases, you might even be able to get maybe faster times with the X-Drive if all the stars align. But nonetheless, they are different and I think they're targeting different customers. I'm not saying one is better than the other because everybody's different and everybody wants something else from their car. And I think essentially that's why BMW is offering both variants to customers. Maybe not all of us want a full M car all day long and an M240i is not only more affordable, but also maybe a better daily driver in some situations. Now back on the topic of the M3 and M4, I was told also by the engineer that they've learned quite a few lessons from the M3 and M4 generation, the new one, and they try to apply some of these lessons to the BMW M2. And that has to do quite a bit with the front end application, also with the tires, so on and so forth. So they've gone through an extensive development and testing of the front end with the tires from the M3 and M4. So if you're thinking that it was random why they picked this wheel sizes and tire sizes there, it's actually not random. It was something calculated. They've tried different configurations, different variants, and eventually they landed on the same setup as the M3 and M4, not for cost saving reasons, but really because they were so good and they fit the car's profile, I would say in my opinion, even better than maybe on the M3 and M4. So essentially, I'm happy to see that BMW is taking some of the lessons learned from previous products or even current products and try to apply them in different areas. We sometimes think that they're doing this only to save money, but essentially, it's not always about that. It's really that sometimes one setup is so good that if you can apply that to another car, then why not? And I've talked about that in the BMW Z4 M40i video where that kind of car was kind of designed around the tire component, and that's why it's such a fantastic drive. All right, guys, here we go. Finally, it took a while to get here, but now I am excited to really push this car on these curvy roads, so don't go anywhere. All right, ready for this one? Let's do it. Let's try to get to know the car a little bit better first. Lots of elevations, as you can see, very, very cool. You can feel the car suspension being really stiff and composed. And of course, I need to get to know the car a little bit before I can push it. Lots of elevations, very unique road, very cool. Let's test the brakes also. How about that? Amazing brakes. Probably heard some things flying because they're so good. All right, so first impressions, quick ones. The front axle is much better than the previous M2 competition, no doubt about it. Not only you can accelerate quicker out of corner, but it also feels a lot more balanced and stable. And honestly, it just makes you feel like you're a faster driver than you are. After you build that confidence, you know, and you trust the car, 
it just feels like you're invincible, honestly, which of course you're not. You always have to be careful. But to be honest, you know, it's delivering that really nice front bite. I mean, the one thing that you'll notice how composed also the front end really is. I mean, it just bites that asphalt really well and you feel like you're constantly connected to the road. You feel like you can brake late also, enter the corner, exit, you know, quite quickly also, accelerate off the corner. And the car is really, really composed on the road. There is very, very little tailspin, and I guess that's by design, because what BMW told me was, as I mentioned earlier, they didn't want that tail to spin too much. They want you to you know, feel like you're, you're just going fast, not necessarily willing to drift at all time. Another quick note on the driving experience is really the fact that it's a lot more predictable than the previous F87. You just feel like the car doesn't bite you. The other one was a little bit twitchy, was always ready to kind of bite you, to get you in trouble. And I'm sure you've seen that, you know, over the last few years, plenty, plenty of crashes, you know, some of them unexpected. But it was because the character of that car was a lot more playful and it got you in trouble if you're not careful, especially if you travel with DSC off. Uh, that just was a big, big no-no. Honestly, I feel like anyone can drive this car really, really fast. The moment you hop in, and especially when you go down those corners, you feel like you can just go fast. You know, you feel like the car is there to serve you. You feel like the car is there to help you be a better driver. And at the same time, a faster one without, once again, getting in trouble. After driving for quite some time, I can tell that I was faster and faster with every corner. I started to learn how the car behaves. I started to learn when to brake, when not to brake, when maybe just having to lift off the throttle without having to actually brake. So you get to learn the car quick, actually. I would say compared to the previous one, you get to learn it extremely, extremely fast. And once you do that, you just can go faster than ever. Now, if you're to compare it to the M4, and of course we have to get to that, it just feels sharper. It does not feel like a mini M4. It feels like the M2 has its own character. This is a car that's not supposed to be the Mini M4. It's just a car that has its own personality, its own traits, and that's exactly what you feel. Now, of course, if you're talking about the driving experience, I feel like the turning is a lot better than the M4, probably because it's smaller and the shorter wheelbase. It is definitely quicker to exit. I mean, the M4 just feels like more of a GT car. This one feels like a sports coupe, and I guess that's one of the reasons why it really, really feels quick to exit. What's nice about this road is the fact that the elevations are really good. I mean, they're coming in corners, so you can really test the suspension, right? You get a bunch of gravel too, so you need to be careful. But essentially, the elevations, also the curves and all of that, it really puts the suspension to work. So you can see right here, I mean, lots of elevations up and down. Luckily, I don't have anyone in the car with me today because I am 100% sure that I would have gotten car sick by now. So you can see the car just dancing on the road, just you know, kind of flying through. I mean, it's so good. Now let's do maybe a fifth gear now. You can hear that sound. I mean, there's a bit of a fake sound inside, but trust me, it sounds really good from the outside too. Here we go. Let's downshift a little bit. The, that rep match is doing its magic. You know, it used to bother me, but not anymore because I don't have to worry now about the RPM. So it's actually a good thing sometimes. I mean, just look at this car. I mean, it's so good. Extra. Really, 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 really good. Honestly, if you buy this car, I encourage you to take it to a Kenyan drive, to a mountain drive, because you will experience the full capability of the car. Of course, if you can get on a track, do it, because I think it will impress you. I mean, I don't even have to do an ending right now, basically. I can tell you right now, this is the car to buy. I mean, today, I don't get excited too much, you know, these days, especially since we're talking a lot about electrifications and all of that, but I'm so, so happy that BMW is still making the M2, and because the M2, it's so good. It's, it's hard to believe that the engineers managed to improve with every generation. Of course, the M2, it's only on its second generation, and I thought the previous one was very good, but they've, they've really outdone themselves. I mean, look at the front, it's just so, so sharp. I would say that no, the biggest improvement, it's really not just the rear end. I mean, it's really, it's really coming from the front. That front, it just turns in so nicely. For some reason, it's extremely stiff and you can feel that in the steering. 
and especially once you're cornering, like I said, once again, you have the confidence that you can turn in quickly, exit quickly, brake if you need quickly, uh, without the car starting to be twitchy on you, start starting to, you know, balance itself in and out, out of the corner. Honestly, body roll, I can feel it. I mean, maybe Bill Oberlin, you know, any pro driver maybe could. Of course, I apologize in advance if I sound like a fanboy. I'm usually not. Despite writing about BMWs and covering BMWs 99% of the time, uh, clearly I love the brand. Uh, you don't see me often too excited about certain things. And I guess that comes across in different videos because I had somebody me telling me that. But honestly, I, when I have to praise them, I have to praise them because they've really, they've really done a fantastic job with this M2. And I can only imagine what an M2 CS will do. So since I'm in traffic a little bit, let me tell you about that in just in case I won't have time later uh, because I'm gonna be too busy going for fast drives. So officially no BMW M2 CS right now. Clearly they wanna sell this car. They're not gonna talk about future products. It is typical BMW, nothing wrong with that. It's just how the communication plan, the PR plan works, the marketing plan, so on and so forth. But there is no doubt that there will be an M2 CS because it makes sense, right? The CS, it's a money maker brand or mini brand or sub brand for BMW M. That's why we're seeing, you know, M4 CSs, M3 CSs, M5 CSs because they make money for the brand. A lot of the parts come from the shelf. Of course, the development time and process, it's a lot shorter than, of course, you would expect it on a CSL. So that's why it makes sense for BMW to make an M2 CS. The previous one was extremely successful, so there is absolutely no doubt that there will be one. I can tell you right now that it is extremely exciting that, that this car is so good because now I can only imagine what that M2 CS will do. Of course, it will be more expensive, clearly a lot more horsepower. Now, you might be wondering, what about an M2 competition? Because that's the chatter online these days and I've tried to debunk some of those myths, you know, and then I guess people just don't want to listen right now. But essentially, even the BMW said in an interview recently that there is no M2 competition. And based on what I know, there is none planned today. That doesn't mean that things won't change. Clearly, it's a very long cycle, whatever, six, seven years, up to 20, 30 probably, so there, a lot of opportunities for the brand to do a lot more with the M2 and they will and they should honestly because this is the last M2 of its kind. There is also a caveat. There is maybe a potential to call a future M2 a competition if they do an M2 X drive. And they even asked me at some point, hey, do you believe there is a potential customer that will buy the M2 X drive? And I said, yes, especially in the US because a lot of us live in very snowy areas or the snow belt or uh, in places where it's not sunny all the time, where you need an all year round car and an X-Drive will do wonders for the M2. Of course, the pundits might be wondering, well, M2 X-Drive, it's heavy, this car, it's already pretty heavy. Are we gonna add another 200 pounds to it or more? Does it make sense? And then I told BMW, I said, well, you know, it's still a heavy car. Even if you had those 200 pounds or not, it's still gonna be a heavy car. You can't change that. But nonetheless, it's gonna be a quick car, right? And a lot of customers are not gonna care that it's a heavier car. Of course, the purist might say, of course, it feels a little bit different than rear wheel drive and all of that. But I guarantee you that most of the people, the regular people will buy an M2 MX drive automatic before they will buy an M2 manual. Because when you go to the dealership and you drive both cars, you're gonna say, yes, the manual is cool. I'm so cool, you know, because I have the manual, the real wheel drive. But guess what? I live in New York, I live in Chicago. Snow, three, four months of the year, very, very cold. I definitely need that X drive. And I feel like that would be the choice for most people. Same thing that happens with the new M3 and M4. A lot of these cars are being picked up with the MX drive despite being heavier. So that's the caveat. That might be the opportunity for them to name it an M2 comp and say, okay, it's an M2 comp, it's X drive. Let's give it that name. But in the end, it doesn't really matter. The change will really come mostly from, you know, rear wheel drive versus an X drive. And that's going to be the comp for you maybe, or maybe they're just going to say, Hey, by the way, it's an M2. You have a rear wheel drive and an X drive. 
I don't know. I mean, they, they don't decide these things that early on when it comes to marketing and naming convention, all of that. They start with the development and then later on they decide, okay, we're going to name this, that and that, more that. So stay tuned for more on that. We're always going to keep you updated because we keep our ear to the ground to try to find out more about EM2. It's such a hot topic. So that was my little you know, tidbit for your insight. Hopefully you watch this video to this point because that was the insight that I wanted to give you when it comes to the M2 and M2 Comp and M2CS. How about this? I'm gonna pull over. I'm gonna be taking this dorky hat strap. I'm gonna put the GoPro on it and I'm gonna give you a POV look of what I see and how the car does on the road. So stay tuned. So as promised, let's do some POV driving right now. So I have a chance to see. Let me make sure that I'm switching to M2 mode. So MDM is on. So a lot sportier than before. course because MDM is on right now you can see it right there it's a lot more playful in the back I'll ride in this one for a little bit so you kind of can see what it does once again speed limit gotta watch that a little bit so I'll try to have as much fun as possible once again look how composed the car it's in a corner right so pretty sharp left hand corner you can see there really nicely composed I mean even in the four gear right so I mean the car is so good I mean, just look at this I don't even lift up the throttle I mean just turning in extremely extremely good I've said it before so I feel like I'm repeating myself right now but you can see how good a car really is. I call the MDM mode the fun mode because it allows you to have some fun without getting you in trouble. I like to play with that one, especially on the track because I have a lot more room if I need to go fast or if I make mistakes. So nonetheless, I definitely use that a lot more in that setting than on normal roads. I'm gonna turn it off at some point because I want to experience the car maybe in different driving modes as well. We're gonna go back to comfort too because we also want to see how it drives in comfort. Uh, essentially, it's not all about sport, so we'll go through that. Shifting is so precise, honestly, it doesn't bother me. I can't wait to drive the automatic though, but sometimes I even forget that I'm in a manual. I don't have to upshift and downshift too much. Of course, red matching helps. Quite smooth. So I have to, I have to, I have to stay within the speed limit. I have to. It's tough. This is not easy, especially when you have some fun. But I get it. You want to be safe. It's not about getting the best lap times right now. It's all about experiencing the car a little bit sportier than usual. Luckily, I had a chance to do it already, but it feels like the day might be coming to an end soon. So I want to take the full advantage of this day and this is probably going to be also the longest video I've ever made because I can't stop talking about the car. I tried to be a little bit more structured with this one, but honestly I couldn't. Once I started to experience the car and its potential, I kind of lost track of the outline of my script and all of that and I just decided to have some fun and basically just kind of share my thoughts as an enthusiast more than anything else. 
I am wearing more the enthusiast hat today than the journalist hat. I, I'm not even going to focus on trying to find any fault to this car because I can't. I mean, I'll have to probably compare it to a Porsche or something like that back to back to really, you know, see which one is the better driver's car. But from BMW's perspective, current lineup, it is the best, maybe. Might not be the fastest, but the best. So, once again, if you have the money, if you can get an allocation slot, go for it. I guess your toughest choice will be then manual versus automatic, uh, which color to get. If you recall, I put a video out already on the colors, so I tried to kind of explain the the different you know shades and hues that they have available. And once again, you know it's a, it's not an easy choice. Color palette, it's not extremely exciting. It's going to get more exciting, but I will tell you more on that if you stay tuned. But nonetheless, um, this is what we get today. So your choice will be probably manual, automatic, and color. So once again, you can see it turning in, you know, so nicely, very composed, no body roll. Once again, really no body roll. I don't have to worry about that. I feel in control of the car at all time, even you know, spinning, braking a little bit. Now look at this corner right here. So just, just nicely done, nicely done. Very good, so good. Now I'm starting to love the bucket seats because they keep me in place. And my sides are touching a little bit, but I can hear everything in the car sliding right now. So I mean, be careful with that. But just look at this. I mean, it's so good. I mean, I could push a lot more, but honestly, I'm trying not to not to be stupid today. All right, so let me put MDM off. That might be a good idea for now. So I'm in comfort right now. So uh, let's see what he can do. Certainly, I can feel the difference in between comfort and sport. That white gap that I mentioned, it's even more obvious when you're driving. There is a little bit of a body roll right now, and you can see the car starts to dance a little bit more. It's not as composed. And of course, that's by design. Once again, they, that's exactly what they wanted. They listened to customers' feedback. I guess the mainstream customer wanted this. And this is why they decided to do this dual character M2. Nonetheless, it is still very good, even in comfort. I mean, it's really all comfort right now, all the setting possibles, but still, still pretty composed. But of course, you know, I would say, and I've said it before, the uh, Sports and Sport Plus are my favorite. Can this day get any better? No traffic, nice roads, great car. I can't wait actually to see the other reviews too. I mean, I, I'm gonna give you some insight, but I spent so much time these days with, as I said, Matt Watts and the Canadian guys, you know, with the YouTube channels, you know, Doug DeMuro was here, you know, Joe Kellis, Rockner, Alan. I mean, so many different content creators, very, very different, all of them. And I am extremely excited to see what they've produced because they spent a lot of time with the car. I wanna see that entertainment factor. I'm usually the type of reviewer that's probably into more being precise about the, the specs and the engineering side than trying to be entertaining. I try, it's not always easy, but this is why I wanted to do this to view a little bit different, a little bit more complex. Uh, I'm sure the other guys have done some you know, drifting and some other shenanigans, and I might be able to do that as well a little bit today, but it's always about bringing the car back in one piece, extremely important. So. Uh, that's usually my main concern, but while still having some fun. But nonetheless, I think you will enjoy these reviews. So this was a great, great choice by BMW to bring us here. Of course, with the M2 and XM as well. So we got to sample these cars back to back on kind of the same roads. And surprisingly, the XM is very good too. Uh, even though it's heavy and it's not as fun as this one, but it is still a pretty fast car. So once again, this is not a mini M4. This is really, I'm going to say it again, I'm going to emphasize it just in case you skipped and didn't get to that point. But this is not a mini M4. This is its own car, its own character. It doesn't drive like a mini M4. It drives like a super, super good M2. And if you're asking me today if I should get the M2 and the M4, I would say the M2 for sure if you love to drive. You're only getting the M4 if you want to be maybe faster in certain situations or if you want to have a little bit more space maybe. But other than that, this is the car to get. I can see BMW doing the record sales with the M2. I have zero doubt actually that they're gonna they're gonna sell a lot of M2s. I'm just hoping, you know, that if they make an M2 CS, which I think they will, 
I'm just hoping they're gonna have a lot of units to sell because you know it, it doesn't make sense to limit the M2CS you know just I get it you know sometimes you won't have that exclusivity but why you know this is the last time you're actually making an M2 like this might as well just build as many as you can kind of follow the one M recipe right initially they said 2,000 something units and that was cool that was one of the reasons why I bought the car and then it turned out that people really wanted a car they were fighting over it and then they said well let's build as many as we can until the last day of production and guess what I think they made over 6,000 units globally and nonetheless it is still still a rare sight you don't see that many of them so now of course I would love to see the M2 CS kind of the same way you know make 10,000 units right you know I have no problem seeing this car on the road quite often as long as it's a very very good car so hopefully they're gonna apply that recipe uh, because I feel like people are gonna splurge and they will be willing to spend 20,000 more on an M2CS I'm actually wondering if I should even be driving the automatic right now because I'm in love with this one but I guess I'm gonna have a lot more fun with that one too so hopefully I can get to push the car a little bit uh oh look at that brace work that was a squirrel brakes did work all the time you have to be objective when you review the car and hopefully you've seen that on our channel we're trying not to be fanboys we're trying to kind of you know uh, look at the brand very very closely analyze the brand point out the things that we like or we might not like and uh, that's kind of our goal really so that's why when I said today I'm extremely excited about this car I really truly am uh, and that's just a, a genuine feeling and I can't wait to go back because I know the engineers are waiting for me so they, they really want to they want to hear from me what I think about the car because we talked about it last night quite a bit how about we test the uh, voice commands a little bit I know it's not relevant maybe a lot of the BMW M2 hey BMW can you find Bartlett Dam Number one. Is that destination Yes. All right, guys. So that was my ride with the BMW M2 six-speed manual. Now it's time to actually head over to the Bartlett Dam, and I'm gonna be swapping cars. So now I'm gonna hop into a BMW M2 eight-speed automatic Brooklyn Gray. And of course, I'm gonna take that car for a ride. I might not be able to do a full loop like you've seen with this Zenvor Blue six-speed manual, but nonetheless, I will have a chance to push the car a little bit and see how the two compare. So before I let you go, let me talk a little bit more about the six-speed manual. Once again, there is a main reason why you should probably get a six-speed manual automatic. And that reason is it is likely one of the last BMWs ever made with a six-speed manual. We might be getting a Z4 M40i that's going to have the same transmission, but when it comes to an M car, I promise you this is the last one. The next generation M5 comes out next year. It's a V8 8-speed automatic, clearly, clearly no manual in that. And then there is nothing else coming up. So basically, next generation M2, it is likely going to be all electric. It's going to be past 2031 DM brand. It's fully electric by that time. So essentially, this will be a historical piece. So if you want to be part of the BMW history and you want to have a very, very cool BMW, which will be a classic one day, then definitely get the six-speed manual. If you're the type of guy that maybe uh, aims to change cars every few years, then I guess you can go with either option, whatever fits your lifestyle. But if you plan to keep this car long term, as I would do, then I would definitely get a six-speed manual. I was in stop-and-go traffic quite a bit today. It is a little bit annoying sometimes, but once you find some open roads, then you can really have a lot of fun with that gearbox. So, these are my initial thoughts. As you might be able to tell by now, I'm like really tired. It's been a really long day driving. I had to focus quite a bit and push the car hard, and I tried different driving modes. I explained those already, but I will be back in just a second with the BMW M2 8-speed automatic. So don't go anywhere because we're going to compare the two. See you in a second.
All right, guys, back in the M2, only this time I am behind the wheel of the BMW M2 Brooklyn Gray 8-speed automatic. So, as I mentioned earlier, it was time to swap out my Zenver Blue for this automatic to see how it drives and how it compares. So I have a lot of experience by now with the 6-speed manual and I've enjoyed it quite a bit. Actually, someone just asked me the question, which one would you pick? And I told him, I said, you know, let me drive this one a little bit more and then I can tell you. I also told him that I'm at a point in life when I'm a little bit more comfortable and maybe I don't enjoy the constant work of a six-speed manual. Nonetheless, it was a lot of fun and I cannot knock it down. But now let's try the um, eight-speed automatic because as I said, when they started this project, there was really no difference between the two cars. They were set up identically regardless of their transmission. So I'm not expecting the driving experience to be any different. But nonetheless, we can actually measure one thing. How much smoother the car is when it shifts on its own or when you shift via the paddles. Because of course, the electronic shifting is always going to be more accurate and more precise. So once again, as I said, MDM mode. By the way, I'm loving this carbon fiber shift paddles right there similar feeling right now really no difference between the two cars they behave the same I'm in the highest setting right now basically the sportiest setting so of course it's a little bit more bouncy on the road and a little bit stiffer than in the comfort mode but I will sample that as well because I'm gonna hit traffic probably in about 30 minutes so I'll have a chance to sample the comfort mode as well and the daily driving experience too because once again it is not all about cornering performance and track performance with the M2 but it's also uh, the question whether this car is a good daily driver or not. So let's start with the transmission. ZF 8-speed automatic, of course, is the same one used in the M3 and M4, but once again, I learned that there is a specific application for the M2. So of course, no surprise there, you have to adapt the car suspension, steering, and of course the transmission based on the dimension of the car, the proportions, and the driving characteristics. And that's exactly what they told me that they've done with the 8-speed automatic. I do recall driving this one on the track, and honestly, it was a lot of fun because I was on Salzburg Ring and I've never been there before. So the idea was that I only had a few laps to one, learn the car and then two, learn the track. So ideally, I prefer the A-Speed Auto because I didn't have to focus too much on the car. The shifting was always there for me and all I had to do was really just making sure that I'm going fast and experiencing the car close to its full potential. Now, we're not on the track today, but we are on some curvy roads, so I will be able to push it a little bit. Now, at a first glance, I can say that I enjoyed the automatic quite a bit. Shifting, it's perfect. So here is okay, up shifting right now. Very, very smooth, no twitching whatsoever, even though you're in the highest setting. So extremely, extremely smooth and precise. Let's do some more downshifting. You can hear the engine. All right, one more. And now up, perfect. One more, very, very smooth. So honestly, I'm not even sure how to describe it. It's probably the same as in the M3 and M4, no surprise there. So if you're expecting something else, you're probably not gonna get it. And honestly, that is not a bad thing because it will really come down once again to your personal choice, personal preference when it comes to the transmission in this car. I do have to answer the question though, right? So, you know, I've been asking myself, some other people have asked me, and maybe you're wondering as well, if I will get the 6-speed manual on the 8-speed auto. I've outlined the reasons why um, I will get the manual over the auto, but I'm gonna say them one more time, just in case you skipped over that part. Manual, one, because probably it's a future classic. Two, because BMW it's never gonna make another manual, or at least not in the M2. We might see one on the Z4 and 40 i but they're kind of having a similar production timeline. So really, these two cars are the last ones to get a six-speed manual. And then third, because you wanna be cool. It is cool today to drive a six-speed manual, especially in the US. A lot of people are calling for manuals, and we know that whole mantra, save the manuals. So basically, it makes you a little bit cooler because you can drive a manual and you can drive a BMW manual as well. Now, why would I pick the auto? Because I live in Chicago, and once again, stop and go traffic, daily commute, daily driving, even going for shorter distances, I do enjoy a lot more driving an automatic. I don't have to focus too much on the traffic. I don't have to constantly, you know, um, 
use the clutch and shift and do all of that and sometimes you're just in that mood where you're a little bit lazy maybe and that's okay that is not a bad thing so that's one reason why I would do that second of all if you're tracking your car I am almost 100% sure that you will be a lot faster with the automatic on the track it's kind of expected it's not like I'm telling you something new here so I should give you maybe the third reason okay this is a tough one because really like the ZF it is not a DCT so it's a little bit different in character but at the same time it's been proven to be a very reliable transmission for BMW it's been used across a lot of different models so naturally they have quite a lot of experience with the transmission I haven't heard of any major faults with the ZF A speed and it's really good so if you're looking for reliability then of course that might be the choice it's not that I heard a lot of issues with the six-speed manual but then again you might have to deal with the clutch and all of that over time so once again totally up to you now let's push the car a little bit more because I've been talking too much so here are some nice bands so once again extremely extremely composed NDM mode so I'm getting a little bit of tail spin right there especially like right now and of course you can see how fast you can go with this car I mean honestly it can get you in trouble in no time downshifting is perfect you turn in absolutely phenomenal up this hilly little hill turning again you know pretty sharp corner right here but then again look look that tail just spins a little bit but not crazy enough right so that's a good thing actually because I don't want to feel like I'm in danger right I just want to feel like I'm safe driving this car and I'm okay with that let's do another short stint so we don't want to go too crazy but very sharp steering once again just like in the six-speed manual extremely sharp the car is extremely composed I mean just look at that off the throttle you don't even have to use the brake basically just let the car do its thing kind of turning quickly once again I've said it before with the six-speed manual it's easy to exit the corners despite of how sharp they might be or of how difficult they might be it is extremely easy to exit them with speed because that's quite important you don't want to slide too much in that corner and feel like you're losing control of the car also entering the corner it is quite easy I can tell that that front end has a lot of work done because it just turns in so nicely so precise so smooth and very very sharp again I might be repeating myself but once again I want to make sure that I'm touching on all these points when I'm comparing the two different cars that I drove today there isn't much to say honestly I feel like I should have kept this review a lot shorter I should have just said you know what this is a great car buy it and be done with it because I cannot find it any fault I mean I have to struggle to find it any fault because that's my job usually and I have to go sometimes into the nitty-gritty details to find a uh, BMW's fault so I can be even more objective than I am but honestly in this case I just can't honestly the car it is perfect it is so 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 good but nonetheless you are watching this video because you want to know how it drives you want to know if you should buy the car and the absolute answer is yes do not even think about it if you're a fan of the m2 body style of the m2 driving experience and if you're looking for a very very pure m car this is the one to buy today i'm not knocking down the m3 and m4 and especially the m5 cs that is a phenomenal car but once you're behind the wheel you don't feel as connected as you do with this car you just feel like you're in the ultimate driving machine and that's such a cliche maybe but you truly feel that even the cocoon kind of wrapping around you right here a little bit you know driver oriented typical to bmw of course the seats keeping it tight in here that just makes it even better so that's my opinion on the bmw m2 of course i do encourage you to go to the dealership and sample the car and see what you think for yourself but for now this is the new BMW M2 I hope you had a chance to watch this entire video because I dropped a, quite a few useful information in there especially regarding future products and some other things and if you have I appreciate it thank you so much for watching our channel we're growing faster than ever actually so we're trying to do a lot more videos and you watching us uh, subscribe to our channel absolutely helps so as always thanks for watching guys and I will see you in the next one